Welcome to the Rock the Stage Show. Each week, international media expert Rich Bontrager has in-depth and personal conversations with celebrities, top leaders, authors, speakers, and media professionals. Now, from the Rock the Stage studios, here's your host, the Trigger, Rich Bontrager. Welcome back to Sunday night, 7 p.m., and Rock the Stage is here once again with another amazing oh, conversation entertainment fun and i promise you you may actually laugh tonight we've had this topic before but we're going to go a little bit differently i think because you've heard me talk about it i am a keynote speaker a public speaker a broadcaster but i sink at humor there's something about having the right punchline at the right time and being able to capture the audience and get the right laugh i have not perfected that my guest has so ask yourself tonight if you start are you really good at jokes or do you just think you're really good jokes? We're going to learn a little about uh, humor, uh, keynoting, and how to wrap it all together. And maybe, just maybe, do a lot better than we did the first time. Tim Gard is a renowned keynote speaker known for his tears in your eyes, laugh out loud humor. He's helped organizations foster resilience, boost employee enthusiasm, and unlock creative engagement and in inspiring presentations both virtually and in person. As one of the few 150 Hall of Fame speakers in the world, is one of the few. Tim is also an accomplished author and innovative mind behind the Extra Stressors. Extra Stressor Stories? We're going to find out what that's all about. Here it is, the one and only Tim Gard. <laughs> Tim Thank for being with us here tonight. What Thanks is that extra stressor thing all about? They're, they're uh, extra. You're, you're they're called. We call them ex stressories. So they're they're things that I've developed over time to people could bring in their office that kind of take the flavor of the keynote back that they can use on demand. Like these right here. These are called "Don't Bug Me" glasses. That when <laughs> you know if you're working from home and you want to know when the kids can talk to you or not, or when you're working, you put these on. People will leave you alone if only for a few minutes. That's an example of one of the extressories that we market. As stressories. Those Express are great. Those yeah. are beautiful. Mm -hmm. uh, back in the day, we had those little sponge balls. Yeah. And that, yeah. that was all we had. <laughs> <laughs> well, and the, and the sponge balls, you know, the stress balls are good because it does put a focal point on the stress that you work to let it go. And I still have different ones of those too. So it's whatever works for... You know, I, I, I just think that a lot of people, you know, some are visual, some are more auditory story. Yes. Uh, during my program, I tried to hit both both areas as much as I can. Do you ever throw anything out into the audience just to you you know, know, catch I, their I'm a big believer. It's called ancillary touch. It's yeah. where when I give things away, I actually will go and put it in their hand and cause that connection, ancillary touch. When you toss it to somebody, it almost is more impersonal. So, no, I'll wait right out in the audience and put it in their hand. You know, right there, that's something to really dig into because so many speakers just stay on stage. I believe in breaking the glass, like you just said, and the audience responds in a whole different way, don't they? Some, sometimes it's almost like there's an unseen barrier there. Yeah. And, and in order to get past it, I'll wade right into it. And you're right. There are two very strong lines of thought on it. I've had people tell me you never leave the stage because you leave your power, but I've done this main stage thing 3,500 times all over the world. And there's been times where if I wouldn't have waited out into the audience, I don't think I would have connected with them as well as I did. Well, and they also do feel the energy because even though you're loud, you're mic'd up and you're on the big screens, there's something really powerful being right there, right in the face, and you hear them in a whole different way, don't you? Well, that's right. And it's why if you go to a comedy club, they have those chairs up as close to the stage as they can get them and people packed as close together. So a lot of times in speaking, I've even had it where when I'm done, they're going to have a dinner program or dancing and the whole front area in front of me is marked off and there's people on either side. It really makes it <laughs> makes it difficult. It's not something I like at all, but but we do what we can. Now, you're also a part of that Hall of Fame speaker circle. We've had several of the Hall of Fame speakers on here. That's a very elite club. There's only 150. For those that are not familiar with our speaking world, give us a little behind the curtain here. What is that really about? 
the National Speakers Association designates up to five people every year and they select, it's called the Council of Peers Award of Excellence is what the CPAE designation is. They shorten is the, the Hall of Fame Award. And it's based on your performance, on your connection with audience, how much work you're doing, your ability to make an impact on the craft. It's quite an honor. Um, you know, Ronald Reagan was one, Colin Powell was one. I mean, there's some there's some very famous people and me. So not <laughs> famous, but yeah. Me too. Now you're also part of another club that I do know about is the Million Dollar Roundtable. That's another very exclusive. I was honored to be a guest one night. And you guys have a great time, don't you? So the, the Million Dollar Roundtable is a speaker's mastermind group that gets together speakers, Charlie Plum, uh, Shep Hyken, Dan Thurman, Chad Hymas. It's people from all over. And we get together a couple of times a year and work on our craft, work on getting better and, and really get to know each other. You know, speaking can be a really lonely business, quite frankly, if you don't con if you don't make a real effort to, to connect with others. And so, no, I, I, that's my, that's my mastermind family. I think pretty highly of all of them. Well, and that's one thing about the National Speakers Association is you think of speakers in competition with each other. Having been in the NSA, it's completely opposite, mostly, that your friends, colleagues, you're trading secrets. It really is a brotherhood, isn't it? It's very, it's really an interesting thing. I've never run into it before where people are very concerned about if I get hired this year, they're not going to hire me next year, maybe not for three or four more years. So I'll refer that to one of my peers. I mean, that, you know, Cabot Robert, the founder of NSA, had said that, you know, there's a, there's a big enough pie out there for everybody. We take a slice and there's more pie left for everybody else. So, no, it's, it's really a, a very positive organization that supports speaking, um, the industry and the business of speaking. So you do something unique. You travel the world. You get out there, you hop the plane, you go to different countries and you do humor and teaching and illustration. And I've heard from different comedians that that's a whole different beat. So the different audience of learning, how have you learned how to manage that? Because our American humor does not translate. No, some of it just doesn't translate. Well, you know, I, I started looking into it that our audiences, even in the U.S., are more diverse now. There could be people from all over the all over the world in just a single audience, anyway. But but um, I started looking at taking my my keynote, my business to different countries, and you know you you have to learn the slang because what's okay in English may not be in another language, and and you also know that when it's translated from one language to another, which happens, that uh, it has to be translatable. I I had an amazing experience. I talked. Uh, uh, the, the, the Million Dollar Club is one of the brass rings for speakers. It's the top insurance, the top financial folks in the world. I keynoted, I've been on main stage twice now. And this last time when I was there last year, uh, it's converted into like 10 different languages. So you do your speech Whoa. and then it's translated to 10 different languages. And it was, it was so funny that I'm sitting up there. I finished with the story and the English speakers laugh and then the French over here laugh and then the Germans over here and the Chinese. And then people saw, realized what was happening and it starts laughing again. It's like the laugh heard around the world. And I stood up there. It was one of the coolest experiences watching this happen. And then it all started up again. It was really, really something else. Well, and that's in, in itself an art, being able to do the joke, pause, stay with the emotion of the humor and the laugh, and then go on to another joke, pause for translation. How long did it take you to get used to doing that? I did I did practice that. I mean, you have to go as if it's in real time, even though yeah. the laughter doesn't always match. And you have to give people time to laugh um, before you move on. And so I, I would say it's something I did practice at. Um, I think the biggest thing with that is sticking with commonalities, like a cubicle in the U.S. is a cubicle in China, is a cubicle in Germany. You know, a cubicle is a cubicle. You stick with those terms. But when they're converted, the reason I, I stay away from jokes, actually, I, I do more stories than jokes because jokes almost always put somebody down. 
My yes. humor has to enhance and never diminish anybody. But a joke, if I translate a joke, you have your setup line, your punch line, and your punch word. If you convert it from English to say Spanish, it changes the syntax and their order in there. And, and so they don't, you can't really translate them all the time. So it's a big thing about learning um, what translates, what doesn't, uh, changing different material to fit different groups. Um, some things I don't think are, I mean, they really don't understand like this, one of my business cards, it's a picture of my pride and joy. Now yeah. that's probably very recognizable. That was Henny Youngsman's original business card, but it's not a common term in every no. country. Whereas no. my other business card is a picture of my kids, two baby Billy goats or kids that <laughs> translated just fine. And then my business card is on the back of it. It encourages people to keep my card and helps make me more memorable. I've heard Jeff Dunham talk about this because he travels the globe and Jeff has the puppets. And certain yeah, puppets are are probably not the right puppet to pull out on stage in certain contexts. And he had to rewrite some material very carefully to not get in trouble with Achmed. And do you have to really think about that? Do you have to make sure you're not going to culturally offend them or do something yeah. that's off? How hard well, is that certain, to rewrite certain your stuff? Terms, I mean, uh, I almost always, there's, there's a lot of great material out there. There's a book called When to Bow, Shake Hands or whatever. There's, there's some great books, but I'll contact the uh, speakers who have already spoken in a certain area. Like the first time I spoke in London, I yeah. spoke to some of our peers over there and asked them, what doesn't work, what works, as well as are there terms I should stay away from? And they did. They gave me a couple terms. But every once in a while, Rich, you still make a mistake. I, I tell a story whenever I get on an airplane, instead of ordering water or soda or something like everybody else, I'll order Tang. So the <laughs> flight attendant will come over and ask me what do you want, and I'll say, "Could you have Tang? And usually they'll stop and laugh and it's worth a laugh. Well, I did that in London the first time. And the only person laughing was the other American in the audience at the time. They don't have a real big uh, astronaut to the moon program uh, like we did, uh, where Tang was very popular. And very important lesson that uh, you got to make sure that your material is translatable, no matter where it is. So that takes me to another question is why don't keynote speakers bring more humor in a bit. And when they do go international, why don't they promote themselves as having the humor and having the good talk? You know, uh, different countries have different feelings on that. I mean, training in Singapore, in, in, in Japan and in other countries, a lot of times they're really big on the content. The humor can be there and should be there. It's just not promoted as much. Also, people are afraid to use humor because they've had bad experiences. Wow. They don't take the time to learn. And I mean, I've spent a lot of time learning what not to do so that I'm funny and not stupid. So what are some of those secrets of the trade? Just give us a couple here. What, what are some of the things that we should not do on stage? Well, I mean, you know, some of the things that we talk about, like Tang, um, what I did was I took my program and sent it over to a friend. And first time I spoke in Australia, I sent my program to a friend there, had him watch it just to see if there were any things, anything in there that probably wouldn't translate well. Even though they speak English, there's still different slang. Yeah. And uh, it was really interesting the things that didn't work. For instance, you know, we might be, we might tease about the name of a city like Walla Walla, Washington, you know, or <laughs> Poughkeepsie or something like that. In Australia, they may have the name of a city maybe 14 syllables long, and so they're not that strange, and they wouldn't find that funny at all. Um, so, you know, you, you, you have to be able to do your homework and research it, and even then, sometimes you make mistakes. I, I, I mean, I know where, I mean, I, I'm, my material's all clean, but I was in Australia one time, followed a guy <laughs> who talks about rooting for your team, and they didn't respond the way he wanted. And finally, and I didn't know how to tell him that that's slang for having sex, that, that that's Ooh. probably not something you want to be asking people. And finally, they burst out laughing and it's like, yeah, maybe rude. You know, so so it didn't have a bad ending, but it, it was it, he didn't know. He just took it for granted. It all means the same. It just doesn't work internationally. So no, a lot of you have to do your research. Yeah. I mean, you have to prepare a little bit more than a stateside thing 
How much does yes. it help you? Well, sorry, go, much, go. Go, no. I was going to say, our audiences are becoming more and more international. Yes. You know, a lot of times now at conferences, they'll be streaming to two or three different countries or in the audience themselves, there are people from all over the world that have come there as a part of a company that uh, moves their people from country to country. So I've gotten a lot more attuned to it just to make sure that I connect with more and more of my audience. So do you read the audience? Do you kind of assume a little bit when you glance out behind the curtain and you see a bunch of Asian people, you, know, you see a bunch of Hispanic. Are you able to play that audience a little bit more because you're ready for it? Well, more than anything, I try to take things out that aren't common terminologies or that may be just American slang. It's like uh, um, I was in Beaumont, Texas, and one of the gentlemen ahead of me made the comment. He said that he was out of pocket the rest of the day. <laughs> and I could tell that the audience, that's a term that may be used there. He also talked about the barrow pit or the, the ditch alongside the road. Yeah. Um, a lot of the audience from different countries had no idea what he was talking about at all. So, I mean, common phrases, things like that, uh, a lot of it is awareness. And uh, uh, you just kind of slowly weed them out, I think. I really try to stick with things that are, are universal or yeah. that, you know, almost anybody would understand. Well, and some iconic symbols cross over like mickey mouse is known around the world right you can yeah. use that anywhere darth vader is known pretty much around the world now right. so there are things you can just keep in and be safe and be iconic about it right oh uh really i mean i was in johannesburg south africa this uh, as we were driving back from the airport there's a guy with a darth vader shirt you know you wherever you go movies have really created a commonality for a lot of different things like that and uh, um, no, in, in a lot of ways, it is a very small world. So we go get clients. We go look for people to hire us. But why should they hire you over other speakers? How do you typically respond to that? You know, it, uh, I had a client call me up one time and he said, you know, Tim, it's between you and this other fella. It was a person I knew really well. Why should we hire you instead of this other speaker? Like I'm going to trash talk him. And I said, well, I will tell you this. Um, I said, I had my appendix taken out 20 years ago. He still has his. And it's just one more thing that could go wrong at your event. And it made the meeting planner laugh and, and I got the gig. But, you know, for me, I get hired a lot to as an opening keynote to get people laughing, open their minds up to the rest of the event or as a closer that when they leave, they can't wait to come back the next year right. that they get fired up to leave. And a lot of what I talk about are things that can help with their corporate culture in dealing with stress. Like very simple thing. I tell them little stressors happen. You put your hand here, you go bummer and you do this, you let it go. And you sometimes you just do it in your mind. I mean, if the president of the company walks in your office, you don't want to be going bummer, but, <laughs> but, uh, but you also do this, you woohoo, that you celebrate little wins as they happen. And it's amazing. I'll get emails, calls from people, even years later, where they'll say, you know, Tim, we're still doing the bummer woohoo to, to find a balance. You know, you, you choose how you perceive the stress a lot of the times. How did you stumble on this? How did you stumble on to the business and the humor angle? Because to some people, business is serious. And if anything tragic happens, they definitely don't laugh at it. But how did you fall into this? Yeah, there's a, there's a time and a place for everything. I was working for the federal government. I used to work for the federal food stamp program. And the higher that I got up, I was being loaned to different agencies. Like a, we talk about the program and show the flag. And I got to be known as the funny fed, which is sometimes an oxymoron. And uh, started uh, realizing there was an industry out there. But what I did was I talked about the things that worked for me. As I watched people burn out around me in these high stress jobs, the things that I would do, things that I would do to deal with stress, um, other people want to know about. You know, at the end of the day, instead of dragging your your work home, you do your dismount. You know, and and leave work at work, and and then the next day you leave you leave home at home. Little things like that. I think sometimes we take for granted, or I did, that everybody does them, but they didn't. And well, it as just, a former gymnast, I got the yeah. discount. I, <laughs> I, I, I totally get that. Um, <laughs> when, when you first got into the humor side to the business, was it a hard nut to crack? Did, did, really, did hard. Kind of really, really, yeah, really hard. Really hard. 
I haven't done, I've only done stand-up comedy one time. You know, stand-up is a very different animal than what speakers do. Stand-up comedians that are in a, in a comedy show or something, you know, that's laugh, 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 laugh. And a lot of it can be derogatory or, or even negative. Um, and I had people that, you know, they'd say, we're not, we don't want to bring in a nightclub type act. And I'd have to explain to them that, you know, I've never done stand up. In fact, the only time I did stand up, Rich, was I was in Las Vegas and I, the, one of the folks at a, one of the shows challenged me to get up and be clean and be just as funny. And I had to prove that I could do that. Wow. And my, Dar my, my friend Darren LaCroix made that happen for me. And so that's all, I only did it one time, but it was to prove you can be just as funny clean. It doesn't have to be dirty. Um, all of my material is upbeat, clean. Well, and there's another side to the comedy act of, of, of that, so to speak, is you probably bring real life stories, things we can relate to. Sometimes there's a reach. Sometimes they're trying to stretch it. Uh, but the best laugh, I think, are the ones in the most authentic, right? It really is. It's that I try to show them the same situations that they've run into, only how I, uh, how I encountered it and what I did about it. You know, the uh, loud talkers at the airport talking on their cell phones or, you know, it's it's about finding things that stress people out that are universal. Um, one of my famous stories is the big sweaty guy in the middle seat where, you know, we talk about not wanting that. And then one day I realized it was me. And so uh, uh, it's being able to laugh at ourselves. Yes. C.W. Metcalf said, laugh not with ridicule but with objectivity and acceptance of self, I think it's really important. Now, have, have you ever been heckled from I, one of your business audiences and be like, get off the stage, come on, guy. I, I've never been openly heckled, but see, I would even handle that differently than a stand-up comic. A stand-up yeah. comic could go right for the throat. You know, I've watched him do that. With me, um, I had a, an event one time that I did that the meeting planner hadn't really informed everybody of what was going on. And they literally made people leave their leave their offices to come down to this room for the training. And some of them didn't want to be there. And there's a guy sitting in the front row reading a newspaper. And so I went behind him and I'm reading like, ah, oh, Olson's cow got out again. And then I walked to the other side of the stage and let his boss take care of him. You know, I, I, I think if it ever happened where we're heckled as speakers, the last thing you want to do is attack that person because the whole audience would be against you then. Yeah. You know, it's, it's more that let them keep going until one of the, one of the managers is, is bound to step in and take care of it. So you did say this wasn't tough enough to crack. What was the biggest hurdles looking back on how you started? Yeah. It? I think that uh, getting known, you know, when people are spending money for an event and a speaker, they want somebody they know can hit a, a home run. Yeah. And so as I was coming up, as I was learning the craft and working my way up, it was difficult to get in because I didn't have a best-selling book, um, which a lot of speakers will use as their best credential. I've, I've booked since then, um, but, but I, I didn't have those standard things. And I just, it just took me a little bit longer to learn the business of speaking. And, wow. and I concentrated a lot on the craft. I mean, I studied, uh, I studied ex vaudeville. I, I studied silent um, humor. I mean, when the, when COVID hit, I was looking at how radio was funny because they, they couldn't have been seen, but they're incredibly funny about how to, how to use the things I learned from that to, to help the, the virtual audiences enjoy yeah. the moment. So I think it's a constant state of learning. It's not like I got it and I can now coast because the only time you coast is when you're going downhill and there's no resistance. I'm <laughs> always working to get better. You know, you touch on COVID and learning the craft. How difficult was COVID? For COVID was you? really, really, really hard for me. I didn't realize how addicted to the stage I was. You know, oh, I, 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 I would take the cat, one of my cats in and I'm performing for the staff, you know, doing gags for them. And uh, it drove my wife crazy. You know, my wife has a business office at home, too. And um, it it was interesting to understand that that's something to be aware of, that any speaker should be aware of is, you know, are we doing this as a business or are we addicted to the stage and the laughter and the applause? 
It was wow. a real eye opener for me. So let me go a little bit further with that because you touched on it, but the business of speaking, I've talked with, I've been there myself, but we want the stage, we want the stage, but we don't understand the business. What would you say about that? How, how can you help out those aspiring speakers? Yeah, I think it's it's finding the people that talk about the business of speaking. Mark LeBlanc in, Minne in Minneapolis, uh, smallbusinesssuccess.com is who I learned a lot of the business of speaking from. He's got a black belt in it. And I think what happens is speaker come, speakers come into this and, and it may be that suddenly they're getting a check for $5,000 or $10,000 and they think, sweet, I can do anything I want. They don't realize how much you need to save and, and how you need to do your taxes and how important it is to set the money aside. The business is incredibly important. Um, how many you can do without burning out, how how we never schedule them back to back anymore. You've got to know that the airlines may not get you there the yeah. next day. You've got to give time to make sure that you're going to be there. I mean, I tell my customers I'll do anything short of committing a felony to be there on time. But um, but the business of speaking, the business about marketing about about uh, making sure our demo videos are quality and yeah. and our websites are up to speed. You know, the time to build your website is the minute you're done with your website. The time you're done with your demo is the minute you're done with your demo. That's just the way it goes. That's business. You know, one of the other areas I don't think we talk about, I think it's assumed, but usually it's two or three speakers at a conference or something like that. You have, you have the line, you know, you're going behind Tim Gart. Uh, how do you best prepare to go behind somebody? You know, I don't have a lot, and I say this in all humility, I don't have a lot of people like to follow me on an agenda. But, um, <laughs> you know, I give stuff away and I'm, I'm, it's very interactive, but, you know, I'll find out who I'm following and I'll find out, I want to make sure that I also give them uh, recognition. Yes. And, and it's one of the quickest way to establish rapport is if the speaker ahead of you was well received, then I think you touch on what they talked about and it helps bridge that, um, that acceptance level. So, I mean, knowing who's going to be on ahead of you, using your own material, you know, I, I'm a big believer in the fact, I, I don't know if you knew this, I Speakers tell the starfish story about the guy walking along the beach, picking up starfish, throwing yep. it back and saying it matters to this one. I I have gone so far as to have an 11 foot starfish costume made uh, where I got up and told the story as as through the eyes of the starfish is to encourage people to do your own material. Don't do shareware. Don't take stories you heard about the lighthouse and the ship and the eagle and the chicken and tell your own your own stories and do them well. You do them so well, nobody can copy you. Well, you know, that's some of the best advice. That goes back to a humorist I heard years ago. He said, if you're going to do physical humor, you go all in. You, there's no halfway with physical humor, right? That's exactly right. That's exactly right. My face, I mean, uh, uh, I uh, was introducing a Hall of Fame speaker and I only had two lines. My, one of my friends, Manny, was introducing him. My, my, almost my entire part of it was my face reacting to what Manny said. Um, and it was designed that way. So the, the audience is watching me. There's so much we can do with our face. And I mean, all of it matters. It's like, I don't wear comedy clothes. I wear a suit like a businessman. I'm a business traveler. It's called contrasting styles and it helps the audience picture that. Um, uh, it's just important that we be fully committed that, you know, I think Lou Heckler's the one that said that we need to be in the now in the yeah. present term and not, uh, not even partially there because I mean, again, Lou said we don't tell and retell we live and relive. And when you do that, you're present. So I'm going to put a pin in that for a minute because I've met so many speakers that do it over and over. They hit another plane, they do it over, and they're just doing a bit now. Being in the moment, reading the room, making that subtle shift, staying a little bit longer online is so important to be a top caliber speaker, isn't it? Right. I mean, sometimes it's little things. I you know, the, you see the chicken feet sticking out of my suitcase. I have chicken feet sticking out of my suitcase. Part of the part of the story is I take it out and I frisk it. 
And uh, while I'm frisking the chicken at TSA, showing him what TSA did, um, my friend Mark Scherenbrock saw me do that one time. And he said, you know, Tim, wait till the audience is a little uncomfortable and then give it two more beats. <laughs> and I did. And the effect was tremendous. It's sometimes it's uh, it's that level of commitment that really makes a difference between a professional and an amateur. Now, you've been over 3,000 different main stages worldwide. I am really want to stress that worldwide. That's very impressive. But what's one or two things you could share about? Maybe something that's really stood out to you, made an impact, or whatever. You know, I think, again, MDRT and the laughter that just echoed around the room, that uh, 10,000 people, I mean, that was probably <sighs> one of the highlights of my life. Wow. Um, and I'll tell you another one that I thought was 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 really important. I I wrote this little book. It's called it's just called Just Plain Funny, P L A N E. And when we came out with it, I was sitting on a plane one day and looked over into the window seat and there was a lady reading my book. And uh it it was a real strong moment for me. She didn't know me. She picked yeah. the book because she thought it'd be funny. And she was laughing. She's over there reading it, laughing. And I offered to sign it. And she goes, why would you sign it? Thinking, you know, she didn't put it together. It wasn't until we got up that I think she realized what it was. But little things like that, those moments really s stick with us. I'll tell you one more, Rich. I had a yeah. guy come up to me at the end of a, a program one time. I'd done like two hours. And he watched me pack all my props and all my stuff up and came over and he said, you know, Tim, he said, I have pancreatic cancer. And I read that that humor may help me live longer. And he said, I think you may have given me a couple extra hours. Didn't tell wow. me his name, didn't say anything else, just walked off. And I had to sit there for about half an hour thinking yeah. about that. You know, it it really, really impacted me at the time. I mean, those those moments I hope speakers take and they hold forever. Um, you always remember them. That's why we do it. I was told at an early age in my career, write down those moments. I don't care if it's a napkin or whatever, and then you translate it back over because you're going to have highs and lows. Yeah. You're not always going to hit the home run. You have no phone calls. I was told to keep those in a Monday morning file, yep. pull them back out, and remember the joy to keep you going long term. Do you have one of those? I do. Um, I do a program every year at Pepperdine University for the incoming. It's a leadership group of uh, students from all over California that will be going there the next year. And at the end of it, um, and I donate my time. I fly down there on my own dime. I'm not paid for it, but I've done it every year. And the the kids in the um, in the audience write me letters. And I usually get nine or 10 of them every year. And I carry them around with me when I travel and I read them. And there, you know, one young girl talked about, she was, I talk about being a humor bully. And she felt that she didn't realize, she thought she, she didn't know she was hurting people as much as she did and how, wow. what a difference it made. And I mean, some of the things like that, that I think those are the things I carry around with me, but you're right. Uh, you, you have to keep track of it because it can be a lonely business. It can be a hard business. It can be a really stressful business. And I have slept on floors at airports. I have, you know, I, I've, I've, I've done all those things. We yeah. need to remind ourselves why we do this. Yes. And those letters, those comments, I think they really help. Now, let me turn the corner here because you did just talk about your love of helping people and these gut-wrenching stories. You also have a charity you're involved with. It's called Win Win Charity. Win Win There's Charity. There's a telethon coming up on December 2nd. Tell us about this. This sounds amazing. So Win Win Charities, Jeff Savillico. You can look up Jeff Savillico you know, dot com. Uh, Las Vegas entertainer that became a speaker. Uh, just a really good person who's who now has a charity, Win Win Charities, that's designed to help kids in hospitals all over the United States. He's, uh, I mean, he's aligned with several other charities. But basically, it involves even things like he had me going room to room in Orlando, hospital to hospital, entertaining children who are in hospital for a long time, uh, entertaining them one at a time. And it was incredibly impactful to me. They're doing their fundraiser on December 2nd in Las Vegas. And I'll make sure that you get a link for that. You can put on your site. But yeah. I really recommend it. It's it's uh, 
it's really been an outstanding experience for those involved, but he really does some good work there. He does humor without borders. He's uh, he's something else. Jeff Sabilico. What's your, what's your reason for doing it? Why do you want to help him succeed with his cause? You know, I, I have been asked a lot to be involved with different charities. This is one of the ones where I saw where this person, Jeff was so committed. You know, I mean, speakers free time is something we jealously guard. And when I was with him in Orlando and we were doing this, he was more concerned he wasn't going to be able to make it to one of the other hospitals that he wouldn't have time. That's the level of commitment. It, it really touched me that that he would be so involved with that. He's a uh, uh, win-win charity. is really positive organization, I think. Well, and giving back is something I feel very important about. And NSA has been a part of those give backs. You've been a part of those give back. It's something that I believe we we should be bringing cheer, joy. And for kids in the hospital, there's nothing better than having a comic come in and crack them jokes and shake hands and have a good time, right? I, or or not. I mean, I did one room and the kid looked at me and he goes, he goes, I didn't think that was really funny. And I said, I said, well, well, I did. I said, I'm glad one of us had a good time. And, you know, I think they're going through a lot of stressful things, but tough audience. But I would do it again in a heartbeat. Win Win Charity. We'll have the notes in the description. Please Great. check it out and be a part of that. And, you know, you mentioned your website. We do want to go there. We do want to have people check you out. So what are they going to find when they go there? TimGuard.com, you know, um, you'll find some of my videos. I think we've got a lot of them on Vimeo, on YouTube. Uh, I have It's called the WooHoo channel on YouTube. Um, I've got quite a few videos out there. I mean, sometimes if you just need a laugh, uh, there's all kinds of short videos on there that uh, are designed just to be able to, to, to poke fun at some of the really serious stressors out there. And, and uh, yeah, I encourage you to go, go check them out. Go check out Tim Guard and, you know, some of the videos. Now, you mentioned videos, and this one of those areas that I have a little a little thing to pick with my fellow speakers. And you use videos highly effective. A lot of videos or a lot of speakers are still wrestling with, I'm a keynote speaker on stage. I don't need this video stuff. What would you say to those that are not embracing the video age of what we do? Well, people have shorter and shorter attention spans. And I don't mean that derogatorily. That's TikTok. That's all the things that are influencing how long we give our attention to something. And I think the videos allow us to touch people's lives or to, to impact on people with some of those shorter formats. Um, sometimes it's just the entertainment. I've had people call me up and just say, you know, Tim, I watched it. And he said, I didn't even know you had a message. They're just funny as heck. <laughs> So uh, I'll take that too. That's fine. Well, and it's also a way to keep the ball rolling. When you don't have the gig, it's keeping the engine going and letting people know you're out there. I think is one of those things we talked about earlier. We need to keep the ball rolling for ourselves, don't we? Well, and there's so many programs now available to speakers that can help you in this process. There are a lot of AI programs where we don't have to spend a lot of money on editing or you don't have to learn a bunch of software that, you can take bits and pieces in there and and really it's some of our social proof that we are in fact out there speaking i think it's really important so where are you heading next where, where where's your next couple of drop off on the on the trip around the earth well believe it or not i'm going to brainerd minnesota next that's my I'm next stopping ground minnesota <laughs> i'll be going there i was just in bali i was at the global speakers federation in bali and was only able to be there for 24 hours. I would promised to do the closing event, had an event come up that I had to do. So I literally flew to Bali, spoke, and came back home. And so, uh, yeah, it it's the world. I mean, we can get anywhere. I enjoy the travel. I enjoy the road. I enjoy the journey. And so whether I'm on a plane or, or uh, in Brainerd or wherever I happen to be, I'll, I'll take those extremes. As long as I'm having fun on stage, I'll keep going. Tim Gard, renowned speaker, world-renowned, and also humorous. Thanks for being with us on Rocket Stage tonight. Thanks for having me, everybody. Great time. Tim Gard, you're going to want to check him out, learn more about him. He is everywhere. And like he said, he is uh, 
also giving back in a very powerful way. He's a CSP, a CPAE, and he's touring the world, bringing joy, laugh, and a lot of practical teaching to the business world. And that's going to do it for our edition of Rock the Stage Show. Come back next week. We have amazing actors, directors, film directors, speakers. Some of the best of the best from around the world right here on Rock the Stage. Sunday night, 7 p.m. Eastern Time. You want to join us on our live chat? Join us on Sunday nights in the YouTube channel. And you can ask questions, participate, and be a part of the open crowd. Or on PPN, where we're traveling the world in 17 different countries now. Rock the Stage is seen every week on PPN, the Public Place Network. That's it for this week. We'll be back here 7 o'clock next week for Rock the Stage show.